Cool. So welcome, welcome everyone again. Today we are joined by three lovely guests, uh, Priscilla Oru, Jennifer Cyrilly, and Ingrid Tewi, who are here to talk to us about why relationships are key when it comes to UX writing. Um, again, I'll just reiterate, while the presentation is ongoing, I'm going to ask that you keep your mic muted and that you um, direct all of your questions into chat. I'll try to keep an eye on that and we will try to address as many questions as we can. So thanks very much for joining. Um, Ingrid, Priscilla, Jennifer, take it away. Hello everyone, welcome to Relationships Matter. UX writing, the bridge between users and engineers. We're pleased to see so many of you here today. I'm not even, 54 is what I'm seeing, wow. And we're going to talk about how we use relationships as part of UX writing at Red Hat. Speaking of relationships, let me tell you a little bit about the three of us before we really begin. Well, when Jennifer Ciroli isn't advocating for easy to use content and software, she's advocating for frequent adventures from scuba diving with sea turtles and sharks in Belize to learning the art of pierogi making in Krakow. Ingrid Tawi, that's me, loves medieval and Renaissance recreation as much as I love user experience and I do love UX. As part of that passion, I perform in Commedia dell'arte which if you're not familiar with it, it's a kind of improvisational acting that was originally done during the Italian Renaissance. Apart from writing in UX, Priscilla enjoys outdoor activities. This photo is from a hiking and climbing trip on the Caminito del Rey in Malaga, Spain. On this route, there's apparently, I haven't been there, there's apparently a bridge 100 meters from the ground and you have to stick yourself on that bridge to cross kind of like your Indiana Jones. Well, when I looked up the Caminita del Rey online, the video that I saw said that it is also known as the walkway of death. So I'm really glad that Priscilla is here to join us today. She made it. Today, we're going to talk about a lot of different ways that relationships in UX writing matter. Jennifer is gonna begin by explaining why these relationships are so important Priscilla is going to talk about how we can help developers to understand our users. And then Jennifer will discuss developing relationships within teams. Finally, I'll finish up by describing a UX writing case history where relationships really made a difference. And when we're done, you'll understand why software engineering is a team sport and you, you're a valuable asset. You'll also learn about UX writing for empty states and error messages and when you're building relationships, you may have to start small and simple in your UX writing, but if you let the relationship build naturally, you can have a big impact. Before we dive in, let's take a second to define UX writing. Now, what is it? Now, it's the writing that is part of how people interact with a product. It's that conversation between the product and the user. It can be the microcopy on the UI, it can be error messages, or even comments on a configuration file if you have a CLI interface. So it's really all kinds of different sorts of writing that involve that conversation between the user and the product. And now Jennifer, take us away. Great, um, thank you so much, Ingrid. So let's talk about why relationships are so important in our field. So as Ingrid alluded to, I think most importantly, software engineering, it's a team sport. When I stumbled across this quote, it really resonated with me. It says that, you know, none of us can or should do everything. No one can or should. So before we can start building great products and great user experiences, we need to start building relationships with all of the players on our team. We build relationships partly to break down the silos that can happen between teams or stakeholders. These things that prevent us from taking a, a more holistic view of the product that we're creating um, and, and really focusing on that user-centered experience. Without silos in the way, 
we can all share the same understanding and access the same information so that we can reach the goals that we've set. We can also take advantage of all the diverse perspectives that everyone brings to the team and their skill sets. And that leads to way better collaboration. And it also helps us avoid our own blind spots. I mean, I know I missed a typo in this slide three times. <laughs> And it wasn't until the fourth time when somebody else was presenting it that I saw it, so blind spots. There really is no shortage of relationships for us to build and maintain. So let's start with us, the UX writers, even though we are definitely not the center of the universe. We have to work really closely with the UX designers and developers in order to provide input into the user flows, the text strings, things like that for the UI. But those relationships alone, they're not enough. We really need to have strong relationships with and between all of our stakeholders. So engineering, product management, customer support, sales, all of these people. And that sounds like a lot. I'm sure, you know, we all are trying to juggle this, um, you know, developing and maintaining these relationships. But if we don't do this, we really put the customer experience at risk. And here's an example of that. This error message, it asks users to wait for a timer, a red circle to disappear. So first glance, it really seems like the kind of UI that creates a good user experience. It is informative, it has specific instructions, it's got a humorous approachable tone, but it doesn't have a red circle. And the text is not quite grammatically correct either. So it kind of makes me wonder a little bit about the relationships between those UX writers, designers, developers, and whoever it was that was supposed to add that red circle. Without strong relationships, we also risk our teams falling into that RTFM, read the fine manual trap. Oh yeah, we know that's confusing for users, but it's okay, we'll put it in the documentation. No, absolutely no. Let's just work together to create a more intuitive experience, one that doesn't require our users to read scads of documentations just to do something simple. And finally, without good relationships, we miss out on the opportunity to help our developers and our other stakeholders learn more about users in general and the specific products that we're building. And by the way, this is the slide that had the typo on it for the first three times that I used it. So, um, yeah, so before I hand it over to Priscilla, um, are there any questions or comments? Jennifer, um, I have a question. I'm Maryland. I'm a technical writer based in Dublin. Um, I just have a hey. question because um, I saw your slide earlier where you have different teams that you liaise with. I'm just curious if you also liaise with a technical writing team and the localization team. Oh, yes, for sure. So um, in our case, uh, the technical writers are often the same as the UX writers. And um, the localization effort kind of all happens um, in different ways, depending on how teams are set up. But yes, those are definitely ah. a part of the mix. Sorry. I see. I see. So um, at your organization, UX writer is equal to technical writer. Um, it can be. We, mm -hmm. we do have a, a few UX, like we have a UX content strategist, um, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of our technical writers kind of do double duty, especially if they're interested in it or good at it. Um, mm -hmm. So they serve as UX writers as well as just, you know, regular, <laughs> not regular, but awesome technical writers. All right. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Sure. Well, so welcome to section two, helping developers to understand users. One of the keys to bridge the gap between engineering and our target users is helping developers to understand all of our users. 
Understanding users involves several concepts and we are going to explore them in this section. A user-centered approach isn't only good for users, it makes commercial sense too. Focusing on ease of use has several benefits, mainly less user error and more productivity. Instead of struggling with the software application, the user dedicates effort to get their task done. Support and training roles evolve from fighting software bugs to focusing on creating improved product experience. The vast majority of people are not digital specialists, but they can achieve and excel in their goals when interacting with technology that is designed to work for them. In this user-centered approach, yes, the foundation is the user, the person who is employing or applying your product, their perceptions and responses. We need to keep the emphasis on them, on these users and not on the product. In the process of understanding the relationship with users, there are three terms that we need to clearly identify and distinguish. One is usability the quality attribute that assesses the user interface's ease of use. The other one is the user experience, the person's perceptions and responses. And personas, those refer to profiles representing different user, user types. So let's explore in detail each one of these concepts. Usability, again, it's a quality attribute that assesses the user interface's ease of use. Remember, it's a quality attribute. And also it is a method, yes, or several methods to improve the ease of use during the design process. Usability assesses how easy an interface is easy to use, but it has several components that are listed by Nielsen Norman Group as the following. The first one is learnability. How easy is it for users to accomplish basic tasks the first time that they encounter the design? The Once users have learned the design, how quickly can they perform tasks? Third one is memorability. When users return to the design after a period of not using the application, how easily can they reestablish proficiency? Errors. How many errors do users make? How severe are those errors? And how easily can they recover from, from these errors? And finally, satisfaction. How positive was the user experience? Were users satisfied with the results of their work? Please note that satisfaction, this is, is mainly an emotional aspect of usability. Now let's explore user experience. This refers to how you feel about the product you are using, but you will see that this concept refers to more than feelings and impressions. Aaron Walter describes user experience as a pyramid of needs that range from functionality to the pleasurable aspects of the experience of interacting with a product. And these are the needs for each level, beginning from the bottom. A product must first, before anything else, satisfy a need and be useful. On the next level, a product must be reliable. That means that a product must give the same results every time we use it. The third level, the interface must be usable. It shouldn't require a lot of effort to learn, discover, and use all of the features available in a product. So only when a product is functional, reliable, and usable, users can appreciate the delightful, pleasurable, or enjoyable aspects of the experience. And the third concept about, uh, around use, the user-centered design is personas, or the fictional representation of users. In this example that you see here, John, the junior developer, is a persona created by our, our user experience team for a middleware product. This profile, as you see it, was directly taken from the user experience slide deck. So it's not that easy to read and absorb all the information in this presentation. However, let's zoom in a few key details so that you can get a feel for what a persona can contain. 
The personas are useful for our product designers, but they also help us writers to be able to create content that is aimed better at our audience. When you zoom in and you read the description of this persona, you can see that John is a junior developer who is constantly increasing his knowledge and experience. He's passionate about programming and he's learning about communication and flexibility. Something remarkable is that John also mentions a typical scenario where developers are required to work quickly to deliver a feature on time. So I would recommend finding the personas for your product or similar products and study them. This is one way to get your user better so you can be more familiar with what they need in a software product and you can be more aware of what could be a tentative usability bug for them. Now, use cases based on UX writing. Besides understanding the key concepts described earlier, user experience, usability, and persona, a good approach to help developers understand users is through use cases. Use cases facilitate the relationship via UX writing with users because uh, they provide real scenarios where users interact with the product. For this presentation, we have identified the following use cases within the UX writing context. Empty states, error messages, and other aspects, including localization and accessibility. These use cases can be applied to establish the very first interactions between technical writers acting as, the, as UX writers and their respective development teams. So let's begin with empty state. What is an empty state, first of all? It's a moment in a user's experience with a product where there is nothing to display. For example, not knowing what, what to do or where to start after the software was freshly installed, yes. A useful empty state will let the user know what's happening, why it is happening and what to do about it. So there are some key lines, key guidelines to, work, uh, to bear in mind when working with empty states. First of all, identify the goal of the empty state. In our experience, we have identified two types of empty states. One is initial interactions. That is the very first user application encounters. The second one refers to accomplishments. These are situations where actions can lead to clear states, such as, for example, removing all of the items of a list. Once the items from a list are removed, there is an empty state because there is nothing else apparently to do. So after identifying the goal of the empty state, it's a good idea to inform the user what has happened and why has happened provide next steps, provide some hints of what the user can do from that point onwards. And if it's applicable, depending on your company's strategy, your target audience, you can be playful, yes? So let's see an example of an empty state message. This is an example taken from Red Hat products, specifically from a cluster manager, where the primary focus of information is the empty state message. This one, no clusters available. And the secondary focus is the new cluster button. In this case, the new cluster button persuades the user to perform an action. Now, the second use case that we would like to mention is, uh, is about error messages. Error messages refer or are triggered when an unexpected behavior of the application takes place. This can be due to the user's wrong input, incorrect navigation flow, or even network issues. Such kind of situations can be frustrating for the user if not handled properly within the product. So when you are working with error messages, there are again some key guidelines to bear in mind. For example, inform the user what has happened, the reason of the message to be triggered. Provide next steps. Once you inform the user what has happened, tell them what to do next. Be precise. It's not necessary to use many words to describe the next steps. 
And particularly, if you are working with non-GUI elements such as uh, CLIs and APIs, yes, try to use human readable language. That means avoid jargon, system terms, or any kind of a terminology that might not be easily understandable by your, by your user. So let's see an example of an error message and its placement. This case, uh, this error message was triggered due to a network error. The message, as you can see, was placed near the, the send button because the error was triggered upon attempting to send this message. And the user's eyes are expected to remain focused on the button for a few seconds after hitting the button. So this facilitates the visualization of the error message once the, once the error is triggered. Now, other UX writing aspects to bear in mind. Depending on your company's strategies and target users, you might need to delve deeper into aspects such as localization and accessibility. Localization specifically refers to the entire process of adapting a product or content to specific location or market. For example, in, in the hardware setting, in an air conditioning unit, you might need to use different temperature measurement types, degrees Celsius or degrees Fahrenheit, depending on your market. Now, in the software develop, re development realm, localization means adapting a product or service to a particular language, culture, and desired look and feel. And this applies mainly to UI strings. In this case, to facilitate the, the communication between developers and users, UI strings can contain a description and the context where they are used. And this additional description is used by translators and the, the description provides details beyond the original string content. Now about accessibility. Unlike usability, accessibility focuses on people with disabilities or limitations, whether these are temporary or permanent. For UI strings, you might need to use area labels because you want to provide content for devices such as screen reader, screen readers. However, depending on the programming languages used in the front end, you can probably reuse the same UI strings as ARIA labels because developers should prefer using the correct semantic HTML element over using ARIA because these HTML elements or tags are in general um, universally shared across different, um, can be uh, universally interpreted by different screen readers. So our key guidelines when working with localization and accessibility is first, know your users, um, learn about their, their uh, intentions and their limitations, as well as learn about the technology stack used for your product. So before we move on to the next section, do you have any questions or comments you'd like to share? So Priscil, there's been some chatter um, in, in chat uh, regarding ways of how to approach engineering or how to approach the folks that are responsible for the UI. How do you persuade them to um, seek for your help maybe or seek for advice? Okay, that is exactly what Jennifer is going to cover in the next section. But let me tell you uh, two keywords, collaboration and cooperation. And, and Jennifer will describe some examples on how to uh, approach engineers and other stakeholders when working in, in software development. So almost Great. there. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, looking forward. Yes. Any other question? Um, let me just see. Um, yeah, it's mostly about how to persuade developers. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> we're going to okay. wait and see. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so I'm handing this to Jennifer. Yes. And she will um, tell you sorry, more details. Sorry, sorry. Uh, just, you know, breaking news, just in. There is a question about localization because I know you spoke to this, Priscilla. Yes, go ahead. So is it really only about strings? Because color meanings may also differ between different cultures or, or am I wrong? Um, asks Michael. 
Yes, from the perspective of UI strings, uh, UX writing, yes, we, we focus mainly on content, but it's true Yes, that localizers have to work with a number of elements such as colors, icons, and their possible interpretations. Sometimes we might have access to work directly closely, yes, with localizers and, and, and see what they are doing when, let's say, adapting a product to a, to a specific target uh, location or, or culture. But us, as UX writers, we focus mainly on UI strings. Yeah, our localization teams on various in various departments do look at those kinds of things, but those are usually separate teams from um, the documentation or marketing exactly. teams. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, well, so now jumping to the next section. Okay, so let's hope I can live up to Priscilla's hype. Um, I'll try to provide some specifics as I go along, um, but there are lots of strategies. But this idea of how we develop relationships with our teams, it's, it's a really timely one for me. I have just started working on a pretty daunting project. So lots of new technology, new people, new types of content, and lots of relationships to build. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about some of the strategies that I've found worked well to kind of integrate and uh, you know wiggle my way in um, as part of that team to help the user experience. Um, and then perhaps uh, pick up some new ones from you. I've already seen a few in chat. Um, I think, you know, when we start and, and we're, you know, it's a new team, one of the easiest ways to start building these relationships um, that are going to lead to collaboration is to show that we care about the same things, right? It's, that's just a very basic, simple thing. So in the beginning, it might really just be as basic as caring about a shared work goal. We all want to deliver a great product with a great user experience. Expectations are another good place to start. So, you know, what does the team expect from me? What do I expect from the team? Are those reasonable expectations? It's a good idea to start clarifying and even kind of negotiating those expectations early on in your relationship so that there aren't any ugly surprises later on. So some teams, um, they know, they already have set expectations for how we can and should contribute um, UI content. For example, uh, they may expect a cooperative or a collaborative approach, which we'll look at in the next few slides. But other teams, they have no idea what a UX writer is, let alone what we can do. So it's up to us to explain the value that we add, to show it even, and to help shape the expectations and the processes for working together. Um, and you know, to that point, I noticed, uh, I think it was Jen, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, you know, made a great point uh, in the chat. You know, one of the great entry points is, oh, hey, can I offer you a, a copy edit or a review of your wireframes or just designs, kind of like gets your foot in the door there, shows them that you know what you're doing. So, right. um, so a lot of teams, it, it tends to, they default to the cooperative approach, which means the product already exists or, you know, it's pretty close to completion. And as UX writers, we're really working in a reactionary mode to make things better in the user experience. So let's say the UI has a broken link to the docs, or maybe a stakeholder looked at the proposed UI, like say this one, and said, oh, oh my gosh, this is so intimidating. I have no idea where to even start. True mm. story. Uh, but these, these little issues, I mean, maybe they're not so little, right? They, they create that initial bridge between us and the wider team, and they allow us to start figuring 
figuring out how we can work together on things like um, reviewing microcopy and user flows and, you know, hey, could we do more? Um, in the case of this UI, <laughs> the UXD lead, she immediately pinged me through time on my calendar and we just went through this UI and hacked it to pieces and made it much more approachable, we hope. <laughs> the, the stakeholders were happy anyway. Um, so it was kind of it's kind of been an organic journey here. Um, but for newer UX writers, or for those of us who are working with new teams, this co cooperative approach, it, it's a really good way to start contributing, even if we're still learning how the team and technology work, and the team is still learning how we work and what kind of value we can add. And it also opens the door for some deeper collaboration. So in a collaborative approach, the UX writers, we, we co-own the UI content along with a dev team. And we're expected to really actively contribute to the design and the development from the beginning. It can be really chaotic, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> a lot of meetings, a lot of different opinions, and so many changes that your head will spin. And here, it's important that for, for us to really focus on communicating clearly, showing the skill sets that we bring to the table, being flexible and, and being adaptable. So some teams kind of start out with this approach because they've maybe used it in the past and they know what a UX writer does. Other teams kind of transition to it either partly or fully as relationships and expectations and skill sets, you know, kind of become more apparent and evolve. And my team in particular is, is in that second category. So we definitely started with a very cooperative approach. You know, I kind of said, hey, I could help you with those UI strings. And and you know, that's opened up a great relationship where we are constantly cooperatively working on microcopy and user flows and things like that. But then came an onboarding tour. And we had no choice but to jump headfirst into a collaborative approach, which you know wasn't a problem because by this point we all were pretty comfortable with each other's skills and you know, we had worked together enough to, you know know that we knew what we we're doing even though we didn't in this case right so none of us really were familiar with the tools needed to create this tour or the process for doing it so collaborative it was um it it took a herculean effort lots of iterations and true collaboration between uxd UX writers, engineering, product management, technical writers, all of that to design and implement that tour. But we did it and it got sent off today to be implemented. So yay. For a little less hectic <laughs> approach, uh, let's look at how Priscilla and her three scale team are using the collaborative approach really well. So they tamed the initial chaos by defining and documenting a really clear process for working together. Um, I know this flow is hard to see, and I, I'm thinking we're probably sharing the slides after so you can really dig in, but you know, it shows who's responsible for each task. And in this case, the UXD team kicks the whole process off by creating um, a storyboard and they pass it to the UX writers who then you know, work on the, the UX strings and other kinds of uh, interaction flows or things as needed. And it goes back and forth until finally, there's a finalized mock-up and a finalized set of UI strings that get handed off to the UI team for implementation. So in, <clears throat> excuse me, in this scenario, Priscilla's team, and they did a really, uh, they did another really important thing, and it kind of goes back to a slide, <clears throat> excuse me, that I just talked to, but they set expectations early on, right? Expectations for which style guide to follow, 
what tools to use to store and share content and track work. Even, you know, the expectations for how to code UI strings in a really specific language. So, I, you know, I think she, um, she's really nailed that. Um, and I am trying to form <laughs> the, the gooey mass of, of my new team into something more stable like this. So, you know, regardless of which approach we use, um, you know, collaborative, cooperative, anything in the middle, it's never too early for us to start showing commitment and building trust um, so that our team members know they can rely on us, they know what we can do. So th this can be done in a million ways, but these are three of my go-to strategies. So first, I think it's really important to make an effort to learn the product, to understand the users and their goals, and to keep tabs really on what competitors are doing, what's happening in the industry. Our teams notice this commitment and our users really benefit from it because it just levels up our content and our product that much more. The second thing, um, and this kind of speaks to the how do I get involved, show up and speak up. Honestly, ask to be involved. People, like I said, may have no idea what we can do. But if you ask, hey, I, you know, I can, I can help out with that. Um, that's fantastic. And people are usually thrilled to hear that. So ask to be involved, but if you do, make sure that you follow through by showing up for and participating in these working sessions and meetings. So, you know, at first it might look a lot like just listening, observing and scribbling notes madly, but eventually it turns into being able to ask smart questions and make really informed decisions and suggestions about how to improve the product usability. And finally, I mean, this is a really simple one, but it's worth repeating. Do what was promised, do it well, and do it on time. If anything puts a commitment in jeopardy, be transparent about it and communicate it, communicate that risk so that everyone's aware. It, you know, it, that makes us look reliable <laughs> and um, you know, helps keep things on schedule um, and keeps the quality up. And this final strategy is one of my favorites. And I think one that plays to our instincts as writers, for those of us who are writers, or you know, really anyone in this field. And it's be curious, like genuinely curious. So I know I'm a more confident and effective contributor the more I learn about my project and my team. I want to understand why we're prioritizing X, but not Y, or what user stories are feeding into our requirements. And honestly, I need to know which of the 92 chat rooms and 10 mailing lists, no lie, again, is the right one to use when I have a question that I need to have answered. And being able to connect on an individual level, that also helps reduce some stress. And I know that this can be a, a cultural thing and a personality thing as well. But, but for me, um, and I'm uh, redacting the names, all names made up so as to not incriminate <laughs> some people. But for example, I, I'm really relieved to know that my, my coworker Simone can fix my GitHub issues without judging me for some mistake that I've made. I really enjoy geeking out with Aoife over journey mapping. And I count on David to break any tension with the absolute perfect Dairy Girls meme. It, it just makes working together that much easier. So taking the time to build these connections, these relationships, it really creates the trust and the space that's needed for really honest conversations and decisions, even if they are difficult and even if we do think that, you know, removing that particular UI string was a really agent idea, but, you know, we're there. We're part of the party. We're contributing. Um, so to wrap up, you know, I know none of these strategies I've shared are particularly surprising, and I'm sure that you have lots of other great ones. But, you know, I do hope that these are useful, even if it's just to serve as a reminder not to overlook relationships in the rush of a release. because. No, trust me, that's not pretty. 
So, um, so yeah, before I turn it over to Ingrid again, are there any questions or comments? Shira or had a question great in strategies. chat. Yeah, sure. Uh, um, you showed a slide I th um, that you tore apart with one of the other um, stakeholders, and mm -hmm. and somebody wanted to see the rewrite. Oh, I. You know what? I that I apologize. I intended to put that in there, and then at one thirty this morning, I forgot. <laughs> so um, I can definitely follow up with that uh, with you. Um, I think it's much cleaner. <laughs> There's a lot. There are a lot fewer words. A lot smaller words and some clear actions to take, so. There's another question in chat. Um, how do you demonstrate the value of improved UX writing when you're not involved um, from the beginning in the development process? Um, numbers to show improvements might be an idea. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Um, I definitely think that metrics um, are a useful way um, we have a, a UX team who does research. Um, so we often will present to them um, different versions of uh, a, an interface or a CLI or whatever, and kind of figure out what uh, works better, what doesn't. Um, we also kind of judge it on the defects that we get. So if there are a lot of people complaining that they can't figure something out. Um, they don't know what this means. They've made an error and they don't know how to recover. We can use all of those and then say, okay, look, if we make this change, this, this helps. So I guess it just kind of really varies by you know, how your organization works and what sort of support you have for showing those kind of befores and afters. Thank you. Um, Ingrid, you mentioned uh, usability testing might work. Could you expand on that a little bit? Uh, depending on your organization and, and your role in it, because right now we're in this huge organization, which I had never worked in before Red Hat, um, where we have a UXD team. They do usability testing. We don't get called on to do it as often, or although we can you know, occasionally, I've done some on things like diagrams. But you can also do just very quick and dirty usability testing where you ask someone to use a UI. It could even be someone within your company. If you have any access to customers or anybody who's like your target audience, that's better. Um, I think that the Norman, the Nielsen Norman group says that eight, well, something like eight usability tests, so eight different users gets you 80% of the usability issues. It's very, very powerful for somebody to see someone stopping and puzzling over mm -hmm. um, a screen. I remember I did it once, I did usability testing once where the developer actually sat in the room and I had to basically make him not talk. And one of another developer just went through what he was doing and tried to do the task. And it was actually so persuasive because he came back to me and he said, well, that guy, he's really smart. I know he's really smart. And if he couldn't figure it out, then how could anybody? So I'd also add to that just really quickly. Um, I, I forgot that we did have another great resource for doing this. We have a really amazing QA team. We call mm -hmm. them QE, quality the engineers, and they go through and do end-to-end -end manual tests with the interface and our content. And they are spot on of, this is confusing, but if this rewording is much better. So grab, grab whatever volunteers you can find. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I have another case history, and there are some ideas in that too for how you can convince people and interact with um, developers and engineers. Okay, we've talked a lot about how, how important relationships are when you're doing UX writing. Now it's time for us to give you an example of a relationship in action. So let me tell you a little story about how I developed a relationship with the Customer Portal Labs team for a specific engineering team. They were in China and it all started with an email from China that I opened and 
no, this was actually from within Red Hat, not an external phishing email or anything like that. The initial request was actually very simple. Shume wrote asking for help, and my manager agreed that I could fill in while they until they could hire a full-time writer, because that was what they were planning to do. And I already had a lot of UX experience, so they so my manager was like, if you want to do that, go for it. The engineers wanted me to proof the apps for typos, grammar issues, misspellings. That was really what they were looking for. But as our relationship grew, they began to really understand my value and they became more and more willing to work with me. So my first assignment from them was this help file. The original help text is difficult to read. It's got lots of dense text. One of the first things I did was I ran a readability test on this content. And that's actually another tool you can use. Um, there are some free ones out there. And the original readability score on a Flesh, Flesh Kincaid grade level was sophomore in high school in the US. So, you know, a, a, about 16 year old is who is a normal education could probably read it. Not too bad, although the reading ease was only 45.9 out of 100, out of a possible 100. So I've highlighted a couple of problem areas in yellow and pink. The text had phrases like, this is an attempt to help you. Frankly, a phrase like that doesn't belong in any kind of technical documentation or help text. It's a lot of wasted space, but it also is really uncertain and customers don't need that kind of uncertainty. The original help text, off, text also explains how any application works when you make a selection. You will go through a server or client configuration guide according to your selection on the app's initial page. Every wizard works like that. Any software developer would already know that that's the way it works. You don't need to explain that. It also had some grammatical errors and typos like the sentence marked in pink. The application will offer you with configuration script for a specific profile. So this is what the new version looks like. This help file is actually still out there now. And I simplified the text as much as possible. One of the things I did was I added headings and bullets. I also tried to figure out what the lab user actually needed to know before they could begin to use it. The new text is scannable and clear. The new readability score is also much better. It's grade 6.9, kind of the end of elementary school, maybe about 11, 12 years old. The flesh reading ease is now 65 out of 100. So the score went up 15 points it's significantly easier to read. After rewriting the help file, I took a look at the app and as far as the app went, this was very early in our relationship. I ended up mostly fixing typos, some grammatical errors, but I did it quickly. I delivered and the engineers really began to trust me. So as our relationship progressed, I got more requests and the help that I was able to give them was just much more extensive. It was as if the floodgates in our relationship opened. Instead of just fixing typos and grammar, I began suggesting that they change menus and tooltips, and they were making the changes. I helped them redesign the navigation menus for the iSCSI helper app. Now, the original menus were just a list of nouns, but these menu items were actually sequential steps, again, kind of like a wizard. It made a lot more sense to present them as active verbs. So client or server became select client or server, version became select version, targets creation became specify created targets. Once all these actions were complete, the user could click that final verb and download the file. We spent a lot of time reworking this app. We also did extensive work on the field labels, as well as the tooltips and hover help for it. I also worked on the microcopy for Rescue Mode Assistant. Now, Rescue Mode Assistant is an app that you use when you're in trouble and you need to rescue your system. So this is a pretty critical application. The first thing that you need is some kind of installation media that you can use to boot the system into repair mode. The original text was repetitive and confusing, not to mention dark blue on light blue text. 
I rewrote it to be much clearer and very much focused on beginning to fix the system. I also made sure that the user was immediately directed to some place where they could download new installation boot media if they didn't have it already. So you'll see it's just a simple bulleted list of the types of installation media they need. I started to get more and more requests and the engineers were open to all sorts of comments. My favorite project that I worked on was one for a tool to help people calculate Ceph placement groups per pool, the Ceph PGS per pool calculator. So here's the original design. The gray text is difficult to read, sure, but there are really much more serious problems than that. The app began with extensive instructions and a key that had you that you had to thoroughly read before you could do anything. In fact, the first instruction is, believe it or not, read the instructions. It says, confirm your understanding of the fields by reading through the key below. Yeah, we don't need that. Because we had a strong relationship already, I was able to convince the designers or actually the developers in this case, because they didn't have separate designers, to rework the app so that it worked more like a wizard with explicit steps. There is micro copy by each step that explains enough details for people to start using it. I did still include some of the instructional text that they had in the original app, but I rewrote it and placed it in the context of where people would actually need to use it. Because we had built a relationship over a series of projects, what had initially started as cooperation actually became collaboration. And I was able to move beyond simple UX writing into even UX redesign. Now here's what we would like you to remember about this session. Remember, software engineering is a team sport and you are a valuable asset. Any time that you spend building relationships is not wasted. I only wish that I had spent more time on that in, my, in the past. Working with your teams on empty states and error messages can help those developers understand their users that much better. And you may have to start small and simple in your UX writing, but if you let the relationship build naturally, your engineers will begin to trust you and you can have a much bigger impact. Thank you. So we'll try to answer any more questions that we can. Um, sure, there is one from Anna. Um, she says that she finds it very, that getting a seat at the design process can be quite difficult and often perceived as disruptive by other stakeholders. Things like velocity may slow down or there's new processes added on and so on. So how can we let, um, I suppose the stakeholders know that UX writers are actually improving what quick metrics can be analyzed um, and can be used to prove um, improvement. Um, maybe Priscilla or Jennifer has a better answer. I'll, I'll, I'll take a quick stab at it. Um, I'd say that again, if you know anything you can do like looking at bug reports, some of them are going to be places where people are confused and you might be able to start with that. Priscilla, I see, is unmuted. Maybe she has something. Yes, we had, in our experience within 3Scale, we had two ways to demonstrate the real value of our UI, UX writing contributions. The first one is, let's say, internal. That means creating workflows. We show the navigation flow of the current, yes, of the current um, application and explain all the intricacies and possible, uh, let's say, weaknesses of that navigation flow. And then we propose a new, a new navigation flow, which is usually uh, simpler, better, more efficient. Yes, and, and we can we begin the discussion with the, with the development teams in terms of technical feasibility to implement those ideas. That is, let's say, internal. And external means uh, close collaboration with our support teams to review all the bugs reported by our customers. 
is in some cases, uh, the bugs reported by customers can be about the product itself, and sometimes uh, the bugs that they report might, might be via the documentation. Because when people read the documentation, they, they think, okay, this navigation flow doesn't work for me, it's not efficient for me, so I'm going to report this documentation back, but at the same time, I will say that this way of working doesn't apply or is not efficient for me. So we take a look at those uh, reports, yes, with the help of support, and we compile those, those reports and, and try to um, propose alternative solutions to the current navigation flows in order to improve their efficiency. So there are two ways to do that in our experience. Thanks, Priscilla. Um, any other questions, please feel free to jump in. There's loads of uh, the people saying thank you for the presentation, how it was very much on point uh, and very useful. So thanks again for, for that. Um, any other questions, anyone? I see one more question about users being too shy to contribute. Well, we, don't, we don't actually have that problem. Um, users are very, very happy to give us feedback all the time, like more than we can possibly absorb. Um, but I'd say a lot of it is you have to ask. Um, and we have different mechanisms that are intended for people to like, they can highlight a section of the documentation for a lot of our products and leave feedback there. And we respond to it, it gets filed as a bug and we respond to the feedback. So I think partly when people see that feedback actually gets to someone who, who changes it, that, that's helpful. Um, what are other people's experiences? I have a, a question for you. Um, so normally in, in technical writing, we would use style guides to aid ourselves mm. and to achieve some sort of consistency. Um, would, would there be um, any uh, style guides that you could recommend for UX writing in particular or just UX in general? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I would go to Patternfly. Um, I can type that in chat. I don't have the link handy right now, but um, Patternfly has a section just on um, UX writing. Uh, there are several UX writing guides out there. I think um, IBM's uh, Carbon has one. Um, I particularly like the Patternfly one because I helped work on it. Yeah, thank you, Naomi. Um, but our, our UX content strategist is responsible for that. She did most of the work on it. Um, there's a few others. There's about a dozen that I've seen, but I'd have to go I'd have to go look them up from previous presentations. Oh, brilliant, thank you. There is another question in chat uh, about the acceptance process. Who is responsible for the copy, the product owner, UX writer, or designer? I think that's a fantastic question. Um, and in my experience, it varies by team. So there are some teams who are very insistent that you know the final copy is owned by UXD or the product manager. Um, in the team that I'm working on now, uh, the writers are going to be the final owners of some copy and co-owners of other copy. Um, and the acceptance criteria, we all kind of spell it out together in a, in a JIRA. And when it gets tested and reviewed, we make sure that we've kind of hit all that. Thanks for that. Um, there was a question about sharing the recording and the slides. All of that will be available for, for share after, and you can probably find details either on the, the Meetup group page. I'll probably uh, post a comment on the Meetup event itself so you'll get the notification, or you can probably find that in, um, I can ping everyone in Slack as well and let people know in the Write the Doc Slack. Oh, and I know Priscilla has used the microcopy guide um, by Kenneret Yifra. That's another one, but that's an, an actual book you'd have to buy. 
Yes, we used our combination of pattern fly and the IBM style guide to, to build our microcopy style guide. But apart from those two main sources, we also took a look at the technology stack used in the front end, because there are certain limitations, in, mainly in terms of spacing and the types of characters that can be used in the UI strings. So we had basically we had to learn the programming languages used by the developers. And regarding the question of who owns or who makes the final decisions, in our case, we need three sign-offs uh, for a mock-up with its corresponding string. One is the UX writers, the other is the UX, the, the user experience team, and the other is the group of developers who will be implementing this because they have to sign off in terms of technical feasibility to implement that design with the corresponding microcopy. Cool. Well, thank you so much for the great presentation generated a lot of interest and a lot of grateful people. Um, again, thanks so much. Um, looking forward to, to sharing this out with everybody. So keep in touch. Um, again, thanks very much, Ingrid, Priscilla and Jennifer. And thank you everyone who joined us today. Um, and hopefully see you soon. Yeah, thank you, Vlada. Thank you. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.